This is the state capital in Montgomery, Alabama. The first capital of the old Confederacy, and for the last 10 years, the private fortress of George Corley Wallace. Son of a dirt farmer, country lawyer, governor, presidential candidate, the spitting, scratching, cocky little demagogue who is today both a cripple and the most important politician in America outside Washington. George Wallace, who once said, segregation now, tomorrow forever, is no longer the outsider, no longer the butt of liberal jokes. Today, he is second only to Edward Kennedy as the popular choice for a Democratic president in 1976. And if there are still any doubts about George Wallace's following and his power to make or break a future president of the United States, then they are doubts not shared by those who flock down from Washington to court him. They all come to see George these days. Even Kennedy, Muskie, Humphrey, and all the rest who once scorned him, and who now watch in awe as millions of ordinary voting people rally around him. Tell all these folks I'm mighty sorry about him here. Did you lose your house? No, sir. It didn't reach up to my way. George Wallace's formula is simple. Never neglect the power base, the beloved folks. Never stop pressing the flesh, white flesh and black flesh. Even when there's been a tornado, there are votes to get in, white votes and black votes. Ten years ago, most black people in Alabama weren't able to get their names on the voting register, largely thanks to George Wallace. But now they can vote, and so now George needs them. And it's quite likely that most of them will vote for him for governor this year, simply because, like the poor white folks, they know he's the man with the power. Joe, she lost a home. Voted for you for president and vote again, man, if you'll run. Thank you, honey. I'm sorry. I appreciate you saying that. And you lost what, honey? Lost her home completely everything. Don't even have my glasses. Can't even read, so don't say nothing in the paper. I can't read right now. Well, honey, you, you, I'm glad you're alive. We're glad we're alive. God's help the rest of them will yeah. live. Well, I'm sorry you lost your home, but I'm glad you're alive here. Thank you. And you keep your chin up here. Sure will. Okay, honey. Bye-bye. Tell your folks hello here. Sure will. Hello, Hi, honey. fella. Glad to see you here. I'm glad you're all alive here. Very glad to see you here. Politics is, is really the man, I guess. Uh, now, the question of whether he's changed or not, I was asked this question, or whether he's mellowed or, or whether he's changed his racial policies. Governor Wallace is now telling people in, in national talks that he was never against segregation. He was only for upholding the law. Uh, anyone with any intelligence at all can see that this is not true. I would like to point out to all the people of this state that segregation, in my judgment, is in the best interest of all concerned. And I see nothing sinful, immoral, or irreligious about a system that's based upon what we believe in our hearts to be in the best interest of all concerned. As governor, I am the highest constitutional officer of the state of Alabama. I embody the sovereignty of this state, and I will be present to bar the entrance of any Negro who attempts to enroll at the University of Alabama. At the height of the civil rights movement, President Kennedy sent federal marshals to confront Governor Wallace's steel-helmeted troopers and to forcibly integrate the University of Alabama. And it was here that Wallace stopped them and made his famous stand in the schoolhouse door. The old political ham has never missed an opportunity. Of course, George pressed only white flesh in those days. Now, therefore, I, George C. Wallace, as governor of the state of Alabama, have by my action raised issues between the central government and the sovereign state of Alabama, which said issues should be adjudicated in the manner prescribed by the Constitution of the United States, and now being mindful of my duties and responsibilities under the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the state of Alabama, and seeking to preserve and maintain the peace and dignity of this state and the individual freedoms of the citizens thereof, do hereby denounce and forbid this illegal and unwarranted action by the central government. <laughs> I ask you once again to reconsider the consequences of your statement, and I'll ask you once again, will you give me the assurance that you will step aside and peacefully do your duty? Very well. Students will remain on the campus. He certainly made a strong stand for segregation. Uh, he may have believed it. it. It didn't last too long. His segregation forever began uh, to de deteriorate at the University of Alabama, which uh, I believe was a complete farce, too. 
And Governor Wallace never really blocked the students. He never even saw the students. This was a confrontation more between black and white, more of a confrontation between the national government and the Alabama government. Uh, from a political viewpoint, this is what put Governor Wallace in the national limelight. It got him a lot of speeches. It got him a lot of appearances on the outstanding uh, programs in Washington and really started his career. So whether you can say it was a mistake politically or not, I don't know. The white people in the South who hold public office are now looking to get votes from a, an element of the population that now has the vote that didn't have them. I can point to you uh, within 50 miles of where I'm sitting within the last three days. A black sheriff said something more or less complimentary to Governor Wallace. In my opinion, that would be a smart thing for him to do, thinking that maybe he could pick up a few white votes by saying that. I think a politician is interested in a vote wherever he can find one. And if a mule voted, they'd ride that mule down Dexter Avenue in order to get the vote, in my opinion. George Wallace uh, uh, believes in segregation. That means he believes in slavery, and that's all. Does he still believe in segregation? Oh, certainly he does. I mean, he just believes in slavery. Come slave holding section, black belt, and he just believes in slavery, that's all. But and a lot of people in Alabama still believe in slavery. He seems to have mellowed a lot, though, has he? Well, yeah, he wants to be elected. He wants it on the payroll, sure. Governor, I've covered all your national campaigns since 68, and I've never seen you so mellow. Well, I suppose all of us mellow with age a little bit in the sense that uh, we don't uh, need to shout as loud as we did to get your attention. You know, a few years ago when we were talking about issues involving government, People uh, who espouse the viewpoints I espoused and as far as big government is concerned had to talk pretty loud. In fact, they almost had to streak up and down Connecticut Avenue in Washington and get attention from you folks in the news media. But after the primaries and the successful ventures of sending messages by showing people that the attitude of people in Michigan and California was the same as the average citizen in our own state, and the attention I paid to our state you don't have to talk as loud now to get your attention. People in this state never have uh, supported politicians who oppose people because of the way God made them. They oppose the heavy hand of big government trying to run everything at the local level. That was the issue. But the media interpreted that because the media, especially in other parts of the country, has to have somebody to fight and malign and so it was our part of the country and it was those of us in public life but they went too far with it because they found out the average man the more they maligned us the more they wanted to hear from us and when they heard from us they heard well my goodness that fella speaks exactly my feeling how can a man change from his views of those days when he said segregation now tomorrow and forever how can he change well, white I think children you are so obviously on? a very intelligent person and whether you ask me that question to bait me or not, or whether you ask that question because you're not familiar with the ability to most successful politicians from to blow and suck at the same time and talk out of both sides of the mouth. Maybe that'll answer your question. George Wallace's audacity is unlimited. Here he arrives at an Alabama high school whose integration of white and black children he once fought so bitterly. It's speech day, and George, of all people, is to talk on the subject of towards better government. Today, the people of our part of the country are respected and recognized as the people who are in the mainstream of American political thought. And I have spoken to groups all over the United States. And I used to say when I was a young man back in junior high and otherwise, I hope someday I can tell the people of our country about the great people of this region. Because the news media in those days used to really talk about your grandfathers and grandmothers and your mothers and fathers. If you read what they said about them, 
you wouldn't recognize them because there was something evil and bad. And they had all sorts of attitudes that were just not in keeping with the mainstream of what those who thought they knew best we should think. I went on a college speaking tour when I was first governor, when you all were too young to remember it. Back when it was very difficult to speak at a college, you'd come out alive, you made a successful trip. Back in the 60s, this was one successful trip from which George came out alive. Students and the peace movement tried a new tactic on George, wildly cheering his every inflammatory statement. This was the old George, the real George, the one the liberals loved to hate, rather like Genghis Khan dressed up as Mickey Rooney. That's right, you little punk, you. Why don't you come on up here? One would hardly guess that the man who has whipped up so many mobs is himself terrified of crowds. I'll tell you what, when I'm elected, I'm going to come back to California. You just try me when I get back. You just try me when I get back. I have always said that if it ever came to the point, he would put cork on his face and paint his face black to get the black vote, if that's what it took to get it, unless there was a stronger reaction from the whites that would negate it. We were not against people because of the way God made them and never had been. That we were basic religious people. But we were against big government trying to control every phase and aspect of people's lives because my young friend, big government is the enemy of the people. There's an inborn, inbred, inherent, habitual antagonism against federal government in the South. But surely that's where George Wallace derives his power yes, from. Yes, and I would say that the average Southerner wants everything he can get out of the federal government but wants no part of it. So when Wallace talks about being against big government, he's appealing to that old Civil War He's hangover, appealing he? to the individualism, the militancy, and the pride that a Southerner has, just like the British soldier walking down a street like he has his foot on the whole world, which I used to watch a New Zealand soldier and, and a British soldier walk with his head up. And I respected him for that. And a southerner will fight you tomorrow morning over a woman's honor, over the Civil War, over nearly anything. We're fighting people, rough people. Another stop in Georgia's relentless day after day campaign. If you travel with him, it's not hard to forget that he's in pain most of the time. Always at his side, along with the ever-present cops, is Cornelia, his extraordinary wife who has plotted his comeback, who stands beside him every morning shouting encouragement as he heaves himself along parallel bars, trying to walk. Someone unkindly called Cornelia the Jackie Kennedy of the Rednecks. In fact, she's a very sharp political lady. From the day she married George, she has set them both on the road to the White House. She has played the role of beauty taming the beast. She has stopped George reaching into his britches and scratching in public. And the other day she bought him a Gatsby suit anything to change his image from that of a little punk to something rather more presidential, or at least vice-presidential. Oh, what was that Julian Bond said? A leper can't change his spots. His spots. Yeah. <laughs> He's a good politician. He uses whatever tactics are helpful to him at the time. And if, uh, if being liberal is good for his image at the time, he'll do it. You know. Why so, isn't he talking about race anymore? Because it's sort of a, a dead issue right now. It's not the best strategy to use, you know. He's just a politician. I mean, he's a good politician. No, he hasn't changed. He just put on the front, really. Do you think? Do you think he's changed or put on the front? No, he's, he's put still on the, the same George Wallace. That's right. He's just and trying what's to the same prove George Wallace? Prejudice and everything else. He's just doing things to influence people to vote for him. He's trying to win the election, come election. Has he got a good chance of getting to Washington 76? No, he's going to be shot again. He really is. <laughs> George Wallace was shot at a rally in a shopping center in Maryland during his presidential campaign in 1972. George was then running as an independent candidate for president and had already won 35% of the national vote in the primaries and had the southern vote at his bidding. Indeed, to those paranoid conspirators in the White House, he was the one spoiler who could reduce Richard Nixon's majority or even bring him down. On the evening after I interviewed Cornelia Wallace, she told me that she knew about a certain photograph which showed Arthur Bremer, George's would-be assassin, and one of the leading Watergate conspirators together shortly before the assassination attempt. She said, we know Bremer wasn't a loner. We know something smells about the whole affair. 
Who really shot you, Governor? Who really shot me? The other day you talked for the first time, I think, about a possible well, conspiracy. Well, I've been asked questions many times. I've never initiated in a statement about, uh, did I hear the rumors about Bremer being friends and knowing so-and-so and so-and-so. Uh, I have no knowledge of him knowing anybody. Uh, there are questions in my mind, though, of how an unemployed boy, man, who was a bus boy when he was working, could save up enough money to buy an automobile and guns and travel to Canada and to New York and stay in the Waldorf Astoria and to uh, rent limousines. And he kept a diary. And he never kept a diary before. And it seems that all these political assassination attempts and assassination are made by people who keep diaries. So I am not satisfied in my mind that he was a loner. Was he a political assassin? I have no idea uh, about that, but uh, I don't believe he was a loner. Of course, it was just a matter of like 30 minutes before we got to the hospital and I learned he was paralyzed, so I never mentioned then, from then on, I encouraged him to get ready to go to the Democratic Convention. And I encouraged him. We used the politics to kind of like a medicine or a tonic. The best medicine and tonic George could ever have is here among his most beloved folks, the Fraternal Order of American Police, enjoying their annual dinner at the Hotel Parliament House in Birmingham, Alabama. To these upholders of that Neanderthal creed euphemistically known as law and order, George can tell his oldest, most tired stories, and he'll still lay them in the aisles. Because George's folks are like that. In 1968, I ran in the presidential campaign and talked about law and order. That it was a shame in this great society and supposedly most civilized nation on the face of the earth that you could not walk the streets of the largest cities of our country because the thugs had taken them over. I used to say, if you walked out of this building tonight and are knocked in the head, the person who knocks you in the head is out of jail before you get to the hospital by some federal judge's edict, and on Monday morning they blame the police about the whole thing and say he started it, and that that's something that's got to stop in this country. Well, one of the candidates in the presidential campaign immediately labeled that as demagoguery, just like I said in 1968 in the urban welfare states, we ought to get people off the welfare rolls who are not entitled to be on them because it's taking money from the classes of middle-class America and pushing them into the ground, economically speaking. Mr. Humphrey, who was a good personal friend of mine, said that's demagogy. But in 1972, when I went down to Florida, the first statement I heard him make on television on an ad was, if you would elect me president, I'm going to get the welfare chisels and loafers off the welfare rolls. And another one of his ads was that if you'll elect me president, I'm going to guarantee safety on the streets and uphold law and order here in these United States. Something that four years prior to that was demagogy. But I remember that the mayor of New York, he challenged me to a debate in Florida. That was his big issue. I wanted to debate Wallace. Well, I was from Clow, Alabama, and I got to thinking about, you know, this is something. The fellow from New York won't debate a fellow from Clow, you know. <laughs> we had 875 people in Clow, and my wife came, came from Tabernacle in uh, Coffee County, so I wouldn't debate him because I said, let him draw his own crowds. He wasn't drawing any crowds, and I was. <laughs> so every time that I would speak, like in Tampa before a big crowd, they would turn a bunch of chickens loose on the stage with signs hung around their neck, live chickens, saying, Wallace is chicken, he won't debate Lindsay. Well, I told my people, I said, you catch those poor little New York chickens because those little New York chickens look nice and good, and I want you to catch them, but don't you let Mary Lindsay have them back to carry them to New York because if they ever get back to New York and get on the streets of New York, They'll be mugged or robbed in 10 minutes after they get there. <laughs> Does he want to be president, want to be vice president or a kingmaker? Oh, I think with Governor Wallace's uh, ambitions would be to, pre to be president. Whether or not he would accept another compromise of that were not possible, but I don't see how anyone, or, or I personally could not see anything except that he wants exactly what he's running for. He wants to be president. Would you like to be president, Wallace? 
Well, I wanted to be in 1972 and 68. Uh, whether I want to in 1976 will depend upon whether or not there are those uh, on the political horizon who represent the viewpoint of the people that have not been represented a long time in government. Uh, I don't rule anything out but I don't rule it in because I have made no definite decision in my own mind. Can you imagine uh, a ticket of Senator Kennedy and Governor Wallace? Well, I've heard a lot of talk about it, <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. I think certainly for the Democratic Party, it'd be the strongest ticket they could have. Mm. Uh, I think the Kennedy people probably would not like it, and the Wallace mm. people probably would not like it, but if the Democratic Party could get that ticket together, I think it'd be the strongest voter appeal mm. ticket because it would get two strong, large factions of the Democratic Party together. They say that when Kennedy, when Senator Kennedy came down to see Governor Wallace last year, that was the beginning of the, the South returning to the Union. Is that hmm. fair? <laughs> Maybe it was the beginning of the Union returning to the <laughs> South. <laughs> On the 4th of July, 1973, Edward Kennedy came down to Alabama to pay homage to the power of the man whom he once described as representing all that was wrong with America. But now Ted needs George Wallace because Ted wants to be president. And George has all those folks and all those votes. How powerful will George Wallace be in 76 in the presidential campaign? Well, of course, this, uh, this depends a lot on, uh, on conditions. Uh, it depends on, uh, on who runs. It depends on the reactions uh, to Watergate. He, he'll uh, obviously have a lot of votes to deliver to somebody. Yes, for some reason that we don't understand in Alabama, I guess, uh, Governor Wallace, although we have printed so much about uh, corruption in government, and although he is the governor, and although he hired most of the people that uh, are running the departments, the people in Alabama have never co connected him personally. Uh, to the corruption. Uh, they consider that he's completely honest and, and completely without blame in this. When he's with his own people, his power base, the old George can be his true scratching self, free from the protection of Cornelia, who has put out a directive that the governor can be interviewed only if his table manners are off the record. Cornelia has also directed that a husband must be guarded at all times, like a president or a Kennedy, or the most powerful politician in America that he is. George's place in American politics almost caused his death during the last presidential campaign. And the next presidential campaign has already begun, and with it a struggle for power in which George and his folks almost certainly hold the key. That I appreciate the fact that you have allowed me to come through the rough years to better years, in the sense that the things that we advocated and talked about, they didn't listen. And some of the news media over the country sometimes say today, have you changed? Well, I said, no, I haven't changed all of that much. All of us have changed. We live in a period of change. But you didn't listen in the first place to what we had to say. You had us stereotyped. You had us in this particular region of the country as something less than good, not quite up to par with other people, and therefore you didn't listen. But now you have to listen because I am so proud of the prediction that I made 10 years ago that someday they're going to discover us. Someday they're going to find us out. And when they discover us, they're come, going to come to see us. Well, you know, we've had the president of our country twice in this state in the last three years. And in Huntsville the other day, unlike what his party used to say, what did he say? Alabama is the conscience of America. That's what he said. The important part is not whether he can be elected president. The important part is whether he's convinced that he has a chance to be elected president. You know, politicians get to the point to where they believe things that are kind of far out. And if he's convinced that he can become president, I think that, that he'll go all out for that. If he is convinced with the information and he has a good feedback, he, uh, if he's convinced that he can't be president, then I think he would accept a compromise of uh, vice president rather than just playing the spoiler part. Could you imagine yourself as a first lady in Washington? Well, yes, a little reluctantly, but I, <laughs> I guess I would be very thrilled to see my husband be president if he would want to. Mm. But I have no desire to assume those res awesome responsibilities. Mm. Ten years ago, many Americans saw George Wallace as the caricature of a segregationist southerner. Today, it's fashionable, almost liberal chic, to say George was misunderstood, that he's really a populist, 
a man of the ordinary people, white and black. The truth is that George Wallace has great power in America today, and it's a power that could decide who occupies the White House in 1976, is derived from an old source, opportunism. George Wallace is what Nixon lived his life to be and failed. He is a brilliant opportunist, a superb manipulator of contemporary American passions and of fools, a political con man second to none. Ten years ago, the issue which fed George Wallace's opportunism was race, black versus white. Today, he never mentions race. He doesn't have to. Today, the ground for his opportunism is gentler, more fertile. He can play at being the megaphone for the ordinary persecuted little guy whom the American dream has passed by. And if that doesn't work, which is unlikely, he'll think of something else. Either way, the governor believes he's headed for Washington. Are you closer to Washington now than you think you've ever been in your political career? When you say closer... I mean closer to holding office in Washington. Oh, yes. Uh, well, uh, I'm not a candidate for office anymore. I, uh, naturally, I'm running for governor. I don't say that I wouldn't be, but really I'm thinking about governor right now. But uh, I'm closer than I thought. I reckon you thought I'd be 10 years ago.